Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's the 9th of March. It's a beautiful Thursday here in Baltimore. I have a great new guest for you, Howard Lindzen. He is the co-founder of Stocked, which you probably heard about that. Uh, he had a show uh, that was bought by CBS. He's also an early investor in Robinhood and many other companies that have gone public. We find out what he's liking right now. You may be surprised at some of the conservative investments he likes, but also some of the very aggressive investments he likes and where he sees opportunities right now. So that and more coming up right now with Howard Lindzen. For the first time ever, Rick Rule is partnering with Stansbury Research for a brand new project. It's unlike anything we've done in the past. And once you see what he's up to, I think it'll also be a pivotal moment for you as well. Rick joins Dan Ferris of Stansbury Research to talk about a critical turning point in the stock market, the likes of which he's not seen in 50 years of natural resource investing. And if you know how to play this opportunity, he believes you may never have to worry about money again. To hear Rick's big prediction and to get more details on his new project, head to rickrulesr.com. Again, that's rickrulesr. If you want to know all about the once in a lifetime financial event, Rick says is unfolding right now. All right, so here, here he is right now, Howard Lindsay. And Howard, thanks for joining the show. Let's just jump right into this. Uh, we had one hell of a 2022, and you know, the Bulls kind of came back in 2023, and recently, They've taken them down again. S&P and the uh, Qs were back above the 50-day moving average, 200-day moving average. Now yields are going up. Stocks are coming down. What the hell's going on? Well, if I knew, <laughs> I would uh, be better dressed. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we are in a tough market. I, I started to call it a little more constructive. Uh, six months ago, I probably a bit... As a momentum and, and growth investor, we saw the signs that this could not continue. Um, and then they stopped continuing. You know, we can blame it on the 0% interest rates. We can blame it on the Fed. We can blame it on greed, fear, too much supply. All the things did happen in 21 and beginning of 22. Throw in a little fraud, um, mix it with... Uh, you know, what turns out to be the, the killer, the break the back, you know, rising interest rates, and not just the rising interest rates, but the rate of change, you know, from earning zero in a money market to now earning, be able to earn 4%. So you throw all those things together and, and, and people had choices. So of course, mm -hmm. uh, when you have choices to stocks uh, and you have a crazy supply from the 10, 12 years before, not even counting all the crypto supply and all, different ways to to make money and blow up uh here we are um so surprising to me you know february of 2023 we're, we're doing better than i thought we were going to do about six months ago where i thought the contagion of tech would spread so so mm -hmm. i feel rather constructive financials holding up energy holding up um and if we were in that big a, a recession or that big a problem, we'd probably start to see some breakdowns there. European markets are holding up because they have less exposure to tech. So, so far, this is pretty much uh, defined or, or contained to the technology stocks, which were trading at crazy multiples. Um, had a lot of these young uh, tech companies were finding out, um, you know, we're great founders, but they don't know anything about the public markets or managing the Wall Street's expectations. And, and here we are. So so that's kind of a summary of where we're yeah. at. So you talked about, you know, having other options and you look at the, the U.S. Uh, six month T-bill right now and it's 5.16 percent. And, you know, I, I think, you know, that's that's attracting quite a bit of money. Um, I'm not quite at that age yet where I'm putting money in the bonds, uh, but I'm not too damn far away, to be honest with you. And it's tough to turn that down uh, for a lot of older people. I mean, be able to lock in 5%, shit, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Um, how, how do you see that playing out? Is there at some point that money leaves bonds and comes back to the market if we get to a certain valuation? Or are, are bonds a nice place to park your money for the next couple of years at this percentage? Well, you don't have to go out two years, right? You can go nine months, or you can even do money mm -hmm. market at 4.11 today. I think we're at <clears throat> beginning of March. So... 
that's really interesting because I'm 57 and I never thought I'd buy a T-bill. Now, granted, 18 months ago or 12 months ago, T-bills were 1% or less than 1% and you could earn mm-hmm. 0.011 in your money market account. So, of course, it wasn't something you worried about or thought about. And now, you know, your best trade, if you're carrying 20% cash or 30% cash uh, for this year, maybe, especially last year, was to just move it into six-month, nine-month, one-year T-bills. And the, w- the reason I did it beginning probably nine months ago is twofold. First of all, it was available. And I, you know, when it was, and I have the network around me to remind me to do that. <clears throat> Secondly, it's my job to, as a venture capitalist, to talk to a lot of my companies that had cash on their books and explain it to them that if you have 50 to 70 million on your books and you're only going to use 18 million in your budget next year, well, you've got 50 million, 30 to 50 million that uh, you could get 4%, 5% on ladder treasury. This is like board level discussions. And these kids didn't even know that. Mm-hmm. And you could get yourself four <laughs> or five engineers that pays for four or five engineers. So yep. there's just a lot of learning uh, that has to happen in the markets. When when you have 10 years of, of markets only go up and valuations go up because of zero percent interest rates, even, even CEOs from Stanford I don't know what the how the markets work. They only they only became a public company during a bull market, and boards have been negligent. Boards, well, some of the board members don't even understand the dynamic because they they don't understand the risk rewards of other of other asset classes. So we still have this discovery of like, oh my goodness. So there's still all this cash mm-hmm. on the sidelines, but most of it is earning 0.11% because people haven't even made the move to earn four percent. And then once people get that feeling of earning four or five percent, right, when they go back to stocks, will they go back to dividend paying stocks? Like we don't even know what kind of stocks they'll go back yeah. to. So, you know, I just think we're in this 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 mode where people are a little bit shell shocked. The people that were in the growth and momentum, and I put my hand up there as well, are a little bit shell shocked. We know um, from the rate of change of rates that it's unlikely that we see, you know, and, and the crash in tech stocks, that it's unlikely that we return to the glory of what just happened. So, you know, we have to put away all that recency bias and slowly develop hindsight uh, bias. And that's that's going to be a lot of, you know, scar tissue to get through. Um, the good news is, you know, there's the industrials, European stocks. There are ways to earn you know, 10 to 12% in the market, you know, indexing, you just got to be in the right index. So that is a big difference. It's just, can people, the average person have that feeling that they can make 20% in the market? It's a tough way. You know, we all know that's tough and that's getting tougher. So that four or 5% is a really good feeling. The other reason I like the four or 5% is keeps me out of trouble where I get called all the time Howard, would you look at this deal? Howard, would you look at that deal? It was my way of like putting a timeout on everything, you know, myself. It was mm-hmm. just a way of saying, hey, you know, I'd like to look at this, but I got nine months here in penalty box, uh, earning some interest. I cool down, get my head straight. So it was more of like a, a block uh, that allowed me, a little crutch that allowed me to just think and say, listen, I've taken a beating too uh, in my growth portfolio. Uh, I'm taking a time out for myself and rethinking. And when you can earn four or five percent while you're rethinking, it's real. Yeah, that's a, that's that's not bad considering you know what the interest rates we've had the last decade plus. But yeah. you know, talking about growth, innovation, and and you know, looking at new deals, you were an early investor in DocuSign, Lyft, uh, Robinhood, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you've done obviously extremely well um, picking some great companies early on. And I know you're taking that break now. You talked about, but is do, do you see any um, opportunities on a rise in certain trends or sectors that you would be excited about if somebody comes to you? Yeah, we're tech investors. So just to clarify, we're, we we write one to $2 million checks, seed stage, highest risk, uh, first checks into a company. Uh, claim to fame, uh, We I started StockTwit. Before that, I showed, mm-hmm. started a show called Wall Strip that was acquired by CBS. Um, we were the seed investors in eToro, uh, uh, kind of the Robin Hood of Israel. Robin Hood meets Coinbase. We were the seed investors in uh, Robin Hood, not DocuSign or Lyft. 
Uh, I okay. was an indirect seed investor through a fund in Uber. And we were seed investors in customer, uh, LifeLock, Manscaped. Manscaped is, you know, not a tech company. It's a, it's a, it's a ball shaving company that uh, has gone yeah. hard, <laughs> has gone balls wild. It's my, my favorite cap here. The, uh, so we've got a good reputation of spawning, um, winners. And when, when I say spotting winners, it's, it's generally people in our network that stand out. And it's generally ideas that we feel, you know, generally if the founder was hit by a bus, could social leverage our firm, you know, at least get it to the side of the road, uh, help the company, you know, find the next CEO, uh, really understand the business. So we generally, generally the companies we invest in, we should be able to explain to my mom. Or the or the website should be so we're very I would say we're in the technology business but we're in the low low technology side of the we're in the, we're idea guys and we need platforms so we've just gone through a phase and let's call it Web two because that's what it was is called by everybody uh, they call it Web two but it was a, more than just Web two we went through this era with the smartphone AWS LinkedIn Facebook Twitter uh, the, I, the smartphone and 0% interest rates. Not to offend anybody, but if you didn't, if you weren't lucky enough to be writing checks or born into that market, you were unlucky. I just so happened to have been lucky to be born into that market with some money and a brain. And it was very hard not to make money. So there's a lot of people patting themselves on the back about how great an investor they were and they're getting their ass kicked these days, but it's, they, they're confusing like the the macro and the micro and the the beautiful tech moment that existed as YouTube hit the world in 2005 and 2006 with brains. They're confusing technology with brains. Um, but now we come to tech post Web 2 and 4% interest rate worlds in a world where Apple is locking down the pipe under the guise of privacy, a world where Crypto is interesting, but the SEC uh, is locking down, you know, for good and for bad. They, they don't know what they're doing, let's say, and they do know what they're doing. But for claiming under bad actors, they're locking down the pipes. And so innovation moves to Europe, uh, at least in this Web3 and Asia. And so there's a lot of really not as good things happening as Web2, right? Because you've got the government clamping, you've got... You know, they're worried about Facebook. Meanwhile, trains are derailing with chemicals because we've given the, the, the train or the, uh, rail companies, no one's watching them. You know, while we're, mm -hmm. while we're watching Facebook and yelling at Google, what are these, what are these American, you know, companies and banks doing? So, you know, someone's yeah. always getting away with something. So, um, you know, the, the, the puck has moved from Web 2 to the next thing. We're in this transition period, period, but during this period, you got 5% cash interest rates. So I'm not an expert of what's going to happen. The good news is what we've, we've got this AI phenomenon and it came out of nowhere. You know, no one predicted it. It's AI has been around forever. It's kind of this mystery. And then chat GPT and open AI, AI came along and it's very organic meaning people are having fun with it. No one predicted it would be there. Everybody was worried about crypto and now you don't hear anything about crypto. So the great thing about technology and machines is because they're working all the time, just when you think nothing's going to happen, something happened. Uh, <laughs> with these machines though, no one's really figured out what the business models are um, and uh, what the proper use cases are. So we're very early in this new phenomenon. We're not sure who and how are going to make money so far it's microsoft investing 10 billion dollars and let's be honest mm -hmm. that's not the same as a thousand venture capitalists putting a million dollars to work across a thousand companies uh it's not the same so mm -hmm. so we're in this kind of like holding pattern um at the end of this fantastic era hoping that there'll be another fantastic era but we're not there yet and so I think you can expect muted returns, you know, and then plus you have all this capital that filed in at the very last moment with a lot of young venture capitalists in control of it, 
who don't really even understand the markets. So, so there is a lot of reason for the markets to just do nothing over the next five to 10 years. And that might be a plus, you know, I was talking to a few technicians and I'm like, man, if you told me the markets could just stay in the 3,500 to 4,500 range for 10 years to pay for our bull market, uh, and all the uh, 0% interest rate, that may be the best thing we can hope for. But you would find opportunities within that. I, I you have know. to. That's our job. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with yeah. I mean, that's yeah. What we do, we find we find the stocks. Because even if we stay in that range, I think obviously it's a stock picker's market. I hate that term, but it would be. And there'd be a lot of great companies, uh, you know, doing great things. And eventually, stocks will go up. You know, as long as your you know bottom line goes up, top line goes up. So I I, I agree with you. And and you know, it seems like right now we are definitely in some type of trading range. Um, and I, I don't know what breaks it out to the upside. Maybe. The Fed does pivot later this year, early next year, that could help. But who the hell knows what the Fed's going to do? They've been kind of chasing their tail for many, many years now. Um, inflation, I mean, there's so much out there, I think that's so unknown. You know, could we see another surge in inflation like the 70s? Who the hell knows? I mean, there's just, there's so much unknown. As you know, it's, the well, market we, hates this. They hate the uncertainty. We, we can be sure about two things, is deglobalization. Um, so that's going to affect growth, right? Like Uber... And Robinhood and a bunch of other companies, after three years, were going into China, okay, in mm -hmm. 2012. That that helped TAM, total addressable market. That gave people the, the, the feeling of, we can pay whatever, this is endless growth. China has 3 billion people. Okay, if you're a startup and mentions that now, people will laugh in your face. So mm -hmm. the deglobalization thing is a definite cap on storytelling and on TAM. So there are some things that have changed. One is the rising rates. One is, does the Fed care? Right? We went from a 20-year period where the Fed cared about the stock market to a period where, in their minds, they're looking at this saying, we've done pretty good. You know, Make fun of us all you want, but like we've raised rates crazily, and the markets are doing mm -hmm. fine. Right? Um, so the Fed doesn't have to care about the market right now, and that's... That's important. So they don't need to uh, save anybody. Um, and, and like I said, the other most important thing is this deglobalization. You got the Russia Ukraine war, you got China and Russia with arms, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. You've got Europe. If we're going back into manufacturing and material world, Europe's fine. You know, they can do fine without tech. Um, so again, there's a lot of under deglobalization, you know, it's there's good and bad, but mostly you lose growth or at least the growth we were used to over the last 20, 30 years. Yeah. So let me throw something kind of curveball at you. You know, uh, Tesla, the Mexican president came out recently and said Tesla's going to potentially build a big gigafactory down there. Um, I've been reading more and more about Mexico, even though like eight of the deadliest cities in the world, you know, per capita are in Mexico. Um, their stock market broke out to a multi-year high uh, just this week. Um, do you have any view on Mexico with, you know, kind of the onshoring that we're going to be seeing and such a close neighbor, you know, friendly with us that we could potentially, or Mexico could see a, could see a boom here with that deglobalization we're seeing? Yeah, I think part of the boom, again, goes to this deglobalization. They're getting the benefit of the doubt. Um, I don't know if my history of trying to invest in Mexico has not been a, a rich, one full of riches. Um, mm -hmm. it's just that place you think is a scary place with the cartels, uh, and mm -hmm. Cabo, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, um, you know, someone who lived in Coronado or lives in Coronado half the year, you know, I blame the politicians right now on these simple things, but the, there's been dumping of pollution from Tijuana into the United States. So Imperial beach in the United States is closed half the summer. And even Coronado Beach. So, so we've gotten to the point where we were fighting about putting up a fence. I think we could get it. We could we could fix some of the problems with Mexico just with some clear explanations from our government of a problem. Right? Mexico is dumping mm -hmm. sewage that moves up the coast and is wrecking California beaches. And so all the yelling and screaming is going on about people crossing the border. We have a real issue that I think 99% of Americans could say, let's fix this. Like, hey, Mexico, you mm -hmm. want to do business with us? Clean up your act. But no one's yeah. doing it. 99% of Americans haven't heard of this problem, right? Where they're 
just destroying beaches in California, or number one asset. Like if you're the, if you're a politician in California, what are you worried about anywhere else except the beaches? You know what I mean? Fires. But yeah. They're not doing that. So I don't trust Mexico. Just, I guess I've lived okay. too close. Um, but yeah, I'm seeing a lot of startups. I saw one the other day about the, uh, um, the Al- an Alibaba. A lot of Stanford kids moving back down there. They're getting educated here. They're moving down here. They're hungry. But boy, it is a tough, tough place to do business especially in fintech because of fraud. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we have Venmo here in the United States for young people. The amount of fraud to try and get a Venmo off the ground in Mexico. So moving money in Mexico, very hard. Uh, But yes, Mm -hmm. overall, I'm hearing stories of manufacturing trying to move onshore to Mexico. But what happens when the cartels want to take a piece of that? And how do you get your money out of Mexico? I mean, all kidding aside, say you are successful in Mexico. Who's going to buy it? Like what American company wants to go spend a ton of money on a Mexican billions of dollars on a Mexican company when you have all those other risks. So I don't, yeah. I think it's a nice story. I just, mm-hmm. I'm a little bit, if that's where I got to go right now to make money, I'll st- I'll take the 5% cash. I was going to say, yeah, stay in your T-bills. Right? Yeah, yeah, you stay in your T-bills. So <laughs> I mean, yeah. you got to like take yeah. apart the story and I'm not that hungry to chase yeah. Mexico knowing what I know. Yeah, that makes sense. But Elon Musk, well, sure. Leave. Elon Musk's a storyteller. Yeah. And yeah. he could say, oh, you know, it's going to be great in 20 years. So we're solving a problem 20 years from now and the stock goes up. He's a great storyteller yeah. and I'm not buying it, but it, it's a story. Yeah, it is a story. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, I know you're a busy man. Um, I ask every guest uh, at the end of the interview, the what I call the island question. If I could take you, your family, friends on an island where there's no sewage coming up. Um, what is the one investment? It could be a stock, it could be a, your T-bills, it could be what, any, any, something you feel very confident with not looking at your phone for 10 years that you're going to put your money in there, at your 10-year investment. Okay, it depends what age I am. I mean, right now it, it feels like, uh, it's, for me, it would be, you know, Apple or Google. Um, okay. Again, I'm already, I guess I just don't want to lose 50% of my money. And I figure yeah. if I'm going to leave my money with somebody who's going to leave their money for 10 years, even though I'm not a super fan of Warren Buffett, um, I'm going to go with Warren and I'm going to go with what I think they will be a financial company in 10 years. So I'd have to go with Apple. Second would be Google. I don't think the AI is going to destroy Google. It will make them stronger. Um mm-hmm. So those are the two, ten, you know, uh, a fun 10 year one out would be taser. You know, at some point we've got to stop killing each other with guns. I think that the stock broke yeah. out to all time highs uh, the other day. One of the few tech stocks that's broken out to all time highs. They have a uh, private cloud network, you know, for the police. So yep. when cameras are pointed at, uh, you know, criminals or uh, you know, not criminals, but uh, whatever you call uh, maybe criminals. Um, mm-hmm. They're the ones with all that. They're the ones that store all that. It's not Amazon. It's not Google. So they're their own private cloud network. Um, and the companies really got great products. So, but that's yeah. a much smaller company. 10 years would be a much, but I just think there's a good trend towards either uh, killing each other in the streets or getting our heads together and giving cops tasers instead of handguns and saying, guys, you know, we got to try something else. So those are some ideas. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great. Those are great ideas. Um, but again, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week and uh, keep up the good work. And when you're ready to get out of your T-bills, I want you to give me a call because I want to know what the hell you're doing with your money at that point. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sitting on, I'm sitting on some cash myself. So I, I well, want to back you. I'm a, I'm a very barbell approach. But like I said, we we're investing out of our fourth fund. Um, we sat on our hands for a couple of years. We're starting to see again, when a good founder comes to us, a lot of what we do is about, you know, we're going to be with you for 10 years. So we have to have a fair mm-hmm. amount of the company. And for a couple of years that dropped, that was like 2% or 3%, you know, social leverage, demands 10 to 15 percent not because we're evil or because we're you know mean because we're going to be your partner for seven to ten years Mm -hmm. it took robin hood almost 10 years to get public so we need to be aligned 
And I think because of all the free money and, and easy money, uh, a lot of tourists entered my business and were willing to pay higher prices, not understanding, you know, the cost of capital and how long you were going to be in these deals. So, so I do see, I, we didn't talk about that, but I do see that as a plus, you know, and I am yeah. such a barbell investor, which is why I'm not super bullish on stocks. I, you know, I take such high risk at the early stage that the 5% looks interesting to me for, for the rest of my money. So yeah. you know, the context is, yeah, I do take a lot of risk. Therefore, you know, T-bills are, are a way to like balance that. You definitely are two very far ends of that barbell. The farthest, <laughs> that. The farthest the ends, right that, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, listen, the best of luck to you. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll hopefully get you back on soon. Thanks, guys. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.